independent and sovereign. He doesn't have to listen to anyone because that's what independent means. You, are, you can act independently. You as an all-powerful God in heaven, you can act independently. And you want him to inherit for existence, you should be able to do that. Let's say he, he becomes non-existent anymore. But you are also all-powerful to remain in existence. How did he become non-existent? So, we have the concept of three levels of heaven, okay. in which that the way you live on earth determines which level you go into, and it's the highest level who are able to eventually... Both of you go into highest level, and then this is what you want. Sure, so, so you have this problem. So it's a logical problem. So it's a logical problem, and this is an illustration to show you how more than one absolute being is not possible rationally to even imagine and, and, and to, you know, to ground that possibility. Because there will be this conflict of will and this, this confusion and ruin will appear. So the very concept that you can become like God, rationally speaking, to me is meaningless in that sense. Because you can't be like God because God is, in that sense, it's totally independent, sovereign king with this will that is command. So if you're going to become like him, you can never go to God if you want. The God that created you, the, the God that created you and made you into God, you can just overthrow him and say, that's it. I don't want you anymore. These consequences of this, this kind of belief is, is, is there. So what we say as Muslims is that if you really believe in a concept of God, then there is this automatic consequences. Creator and the created distinction. The creation can never be like God, ever. By definition, they will be limited, they will be finite, they will be dependent. These three essential characteristics, the creation will have in relation to the creator that created them. The moment you are created here, doesn't matter what happens to you, you are already limited and finite and dependent. The moment you, because you are dependent once, you, you, you are already dependent. You never become independent. Yeah? God who was independent to begin with, he will always remain independent. Yeah. So that's the, some of the questions that we can reflect on in terms of, if you, if you want to um, address, you know, that you have uh, something to share with me in terms of how do you solve this problem, go ahead, listen. If not, I can ask you some other questions about what are your objective evidence that you can share about the, the truth in Mormonism in terms of the Book of Mormon, for example, how do we know for sure objectively that this is indeed from God rather than rather than simply oh, it's you know it's claims from God. So how do you know that any scripture objectively is of God? You have to search you, it you, out for you, yourself. You test it. You have to yeah, that's it. So, so what are the falsification tests that you can offer? The spirit. What, one of the core beliefs of our doctrine is that we encourage you to read the Book of Mormon for yourself. It's not on us. You read it for yourself and at the end there is a passage of passage of scripture where it encourages you to pray for yourself and then have the spirit testify to you if it's true. If you don't if the spirit doesn't come to you, then that's okay. It's not true to you. But we I have had a personal witness of the spirit to me, and as I'm sure you've had it with Ron. Yeah, but that's subjective. That's sure, subjective. it is. Yeah. yeah, it is subjective. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're asking for. The question I asked you in the very beginning is, what objective evidence can you share and objective, not experience, evidence? There's a difference between our personal sure, experience sure. and evidence. So if I were to tell you like the Quran, as my brother here explained a little bit earlier on, perhaps, in terms of how we can objectively demonstrate the, the divine origin. So the Book of Mormon, for example, we can read it and it must give us something either to falsify it or to testify this Yes. So if so there have been a bunch of studies done on it, as I'm sure there have the Quran. I'm not saying that the Quran doesn't have truth in it, I think that a ton of the books of scripture do. I'm not objectifying that. But so in the Book of Mormon there are uh, evidence so it was it was revealed to Joseph Smith, who lived in the Americas in the eighteen hundreds and didn't have beyond a third grade level education. However, as studies have been done on it, they have found that the tone of writing doesn't change, which is really impossible if it's not, you know, revealed to you. There is ancient writing uses, such as chiasmus, that he would not have known due to his 
education level at the time. There's um, there's also been a little bit of archaeological evidence found, so that's some objective evidence. If that's what, what, what is that as a unique to demonstrate that it cannot be from human being, but it can only be from God? It's yes. charismatic it's structure you talked about, the linguistic devices that we see. It's quite common in the ancient literature, for example, how even in the Old Testament. And in fact, when we read the Book of Mormon, we see a lot of it's like from the King James Version type of things. The language that you find is coming from there, the yeah. from the Old Testament. It doesn't reflect someone like, you know, sometimes when you read something, it gives you the first impression counts. It gives you the impression like, who knows, he knows he's talking about, or this father knows what they're talking about. So, how can we falsify this book? It's because it comes from a fifth, uh, what was he, 17 year old with a lower than third grade education level in New York, who shouldn't have been able to write that, even if he was some, which he wasn't, you know, he was, we've looked at other letters that he's written and he was not very good at writing, in other words, you know, he could write letters, but he wasn't very lyrical, didn't know all this stuff, but it came forth through him, and to us that shows the power yeah, What is it unique that one cannot write something like the Book of Mormon? Because you can get someone now today, and then come up with copying exactly the same kind of linguistic genre uh, that you have in, in, in the Book of Mormon, copying from the Old Testament passages from here and there, modifying a little bit here and there, and then produce something like it. I mean, this is what we put in with, with all due respect, when someone reads the Book of Mormon, they can automatically link that with like, the Old Testament writings, and this is someone's little bit of changes here and there. But what is so unique that gives you the divine hallmark that this is from God? That's what we're looking at. The Quran has that, but that's a different discussion. In the Book of Mormon, would you, you need... Would, would you like to tell us what the Quran is? Well, explain something in the Quran. You cannot imitate even a smallest chapter of the Quran because of the linguistic composition that it is. Yes. It's the way it's composed. Yeah. It is, you can bring the, the most proficient of Arabic speaker or someone who's learned Arabic language and will not be able to bring within this composition to make imitate like it. You know how Shakespeare's sonnet is in terms of how he writes. Say you know, 14 words in a line, whatever and so on. There is some objective measure in which we can actually construct this poetry. Quran is not like any of these poetries in Arabic language people know of. It has its own roots. It has its own composition styles, called the Quranic stylistics. And it asks you to imitate something like it. The fact that when you're about to imitate something like it, because the Quran has from, of course, God's speech, the composition makes sense. If you were to use the same stylistics, it simply doesn't make sense. I'll give you an example. When the Quran says, No bearer can be at the burden of another one. It's like, no bearer, yourself, you cannot bear the burden of someone else. You are only responsible for what you can bear. The Arabic language is used like the word wazara, as you just heard. Yes. Um, if you were to substitute this same stylistic pattern with another, say, a synonym, synonymous word, it simply then cannot work and give you this meaning and becomes a laughable meaning. Like, no um, pregnant woman can bear the pregnancy of another. This becomes like this. If, if you were to work hard, la hamilatun. Uh, something like this, illa himla ukhra. Because the word now, hamila, the word which is a synonym to was or to be, refers to a pregnant woman. Because that word denotes a woman who's pregnant. And substituting this kind of pattern within this structure, it becomes a laughable sentence. So this is what throughout every single composition of the Quran, if you were to substitute and put another synonymous word or a verb or so on and so forth, it, it messes up altogether. But when the Quran introduced it, it's more like this. That was the, 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 the uniqueness of the Quranic eloquence and the composition at that time. That's one of the miraculous challenges of the Quran to falsify it if it's not from God. Can I suggest something? Since religion is referring to God and is therefore of a very spiritual nature, how about you read the Book of Mormon and I read the Quran? And then I've read it. I've read it since the moment. Have you ago. read the entire thing? Uh, no. I'll read the entire Quran. Yeah, read the entire Quran. But awesome. tell me.
help me. No, no, what I'm saying is, I can't. No, no, what, what I'm saying is, you need to give me a good reason to read the entire book, given the, the amount of out, 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 outstanding thing that I have for now. Um, I can't subscribe to this kind of task at this very minute. But, but in principle, I agree with you, it makes sense that I should read full of the book, all of it, from cover to cover, and you read the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's so, do so, it. so when, no, no, you do it, but I, you know, I will try when I try to get this time into you know, in my busy schedules. But in the meantime, uh, would you like to share something about some uniqueness of this book? So it helps me to, to give me this form to say, you know what, leave all those tasks that you're doing, your know, presentations or whatever that you, know, you have to do on Monday. Yeah. For example, you know, anything else you want to share? Because I can give you something for you to look on the Quran to give you like real prompts to say, ah, oh, that's interesting. So let me explore further. All I can do is give you a witness of the personal nature of it to me, that I know it is true. I've had the spirit witness to me. And for me personally, it is the way that I believe I can come closest to God. And that is what I have for you. I'm sorry. I'm not a very, I'm not a very, I'm, I'm young. I'm 19. So I don't know very much of the ways of the world or any of that. I don't know how to give you some big speech. But what I do know is that for me, the Book of Mormon has a ton of spirit. I feel the spirit when I read it. And for me personally, I know it is true. And that's what I can give you. I appreciate, Thank you. I appreciate your connection spiritually with this book. But do you also... Can you see, can you imagine at least that the personal connection one can have with any book? It could be books of the Hindus, for example, it could be books of the Buddhist text, or it could be a book when someone reads the Harry Potter and they have that connection, deep connection, and they feel so much. Because these personal spiritual connections can happen and people can be led and directed to live their life because they're moved by it. You can read a book, a, a novel by a particular author, and you say, ah, actually, it makes sense. Let me live my life as a vegetarian because cruelty animals, you know what? We don't want to do that anymore. And you change your life and you live according to it. We're asking for something other than that. There is not only a spiritual self discovery, not only a spiritual self. Oh, no. Jesus was the way during his time. Yes. So was Moses during his time. Every prophet, every messenger was the way during their time. But as the time passed, another prophet came. If it was normal book of Joseph Smith, then it makes sense that he needs to be followed. If he was the prophet of God, if Prophet Muhammad was the prophet of God, and he says there's no other after him, the finality of God's message, the finality of prophethood, then he should think, why am I reading another book? If I'm convinced the Quran, God has revealed and said he sealed it, this message is now completed. God's final guidance is given and perfected. You don't need another prophet, another messenger. Then you don't need to seek you don't need to seek anything else. So that is, in principle, the approach one can take. But what I'm saying is, other than the spiritual connection, one thing is the intellectual query and exploration. In terms of, rather than just simply saying, you know, it feels good, it pulls me, I feel happy, but something else. Think about it. Is it possible that this could be all? Can I direct you? So I am 19. I obviously have not done a ton of studies on my own because I am just finished high school. This is what I personally believe. But there have been a lot of studies done. So if you go to BYU, so I come from a college that has done a lot of studies. So if you would like to research that topic more, I recommend you go to BYU and search up BYU. Which university is that? Brigham Young University. Brigham Young University. So they have done a lot of studies. If you would like to do, if you would like yeah, to search that up. Absolutely, no problem with that. Because I have seen already some studies. In fact, some of my friends have um, done some works on this already. In terms of the very works of Joseph Smith and the people that may have composed it and the, 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 the few elders that we have together. So I, I, I am exposed to the critical studies already. So further studies is not going to be a problem. And where can I find the studies on the Quran? The Quran. What? What I'm simply asking you to critically examine this yes. book. Why is it? 
not possible? So why is it not possible? Don't worry about it. Sorry. Is, it, is it just an accident? Why is it not possible to imitate this book? Why is this book free from contradictions? How does this book talk about all these things people describe in terms of prophecies or the natural world? I guess I have one more, uh, one more question for you referring to something you said earlier. I guess, do you guys have living prophets today? We have the finality of prophets because God has told us that he, he has completed his favor upon us, he has perfected our religion and made Islam for our, as, as the finality of our religion. So what we need is no other prophets, no other messenger. We just need to follow this message that is there. The foundation of the message is there. We can live and we can seek any solutions to any problems based on the Quran and the teaching of the prophet based on, 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 on his manifestations of the Quran because he was a walking Quran. So if you bring problems of euthanasia or abortions, you name it, anything, Islam has that solution to offer. But you have a concept which is different, in which there's a living prophet throughout, yes. isn't it? And you have the same problem then continuously. How do you determine that prophet is a prophet of God? What are the evidence for his prophethood or her prophethood, prophetess, for example? So these, these things, do you really critically determine someone a prophet of God or not? So again, that's a very... So in my opinion, because religion deals with God, we have to rely on the spirit. And that's another one. But thank you for having this debate with me. Stop. If you don't, um, I hope you don't get offended. No. Uh, we don't shake hands with... Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, Opposite don't gender. But that's, that's what it is. And of course, if it was my wife or my mother and sister, yes. different. But, and, and you perhaps know the reasons already. Because, um, you know, there's always a chance of, you know, attraction between um, the opposite genders. So try to minimize all of this. Because, I'm sorry. No, 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 don't be, don't be. Because perhaps you don't know. But that's how Muslims are. And that's one of the things people don't appreciate also, like when we have Muslim patients who are like females, women, and the doctors come and start shaking hands and they feel like, oh, like you're an alien and something like that. Yes. And they, they, they find that there's already a communication gap or something. And I hope, you know, people learn more about each of our cultures and our differences between these practices. Even like Jewish women, for example, you know, you find that they would not allow someone to you know, shake hands with them and so on. And if you think about it, um, psychologically, you know, spiritually and so on and so forth, you see that why should we in the first place? Because if you imagine now we had a culture in which someone started kissing on their lips as a gesture of like saying goodbye. At this very moment, you will say, oh, that's too much, <laughs> isn't it? But that's how we feel about shaking hands, because just as you feel about kissing in the lips, there is some kind of significance, you know, physical connection and so on and so forth. Shaking of hands can also have that kind of significance. So is there anything else, any other customs I should know when interacting with... Like this, we, we for example, we, we sometimes, out of respect, we put our hand on it just like this, out of respect, that's all, for the opposite to that, to show that, the respect to that, you know, it's not, you know, we, it's not a personal thing. It's only to say we respect you, we honor you, and that's it. As simple as that. That's what we generally do in many Muslim countries. Yeah. So you will see Muslim women would not, and Muslim men, for example, would not socialize in clubs, you know, parties, and so on and so forth. You know, people have this leaving dues, people have this, this, you know, during Christmas and other things. Why you will see like, oh, this he says he can't come, he's busy or something, because we, we can't be participating in this kind of gatherings yeah. are reasons because there are some restrictions in terms of what is permissible within the boundary of our living and what is not. Um, and reasons. Um, to explore it for why are we going to go and start going into a nightclub and start dancing and you know mingling with each other and what does it do in terms of you know physical purity of one another's thoughts um, and intentions because in terms of something that we often forget people think like you know it's okay but you know when people start hugging with each other in the opposite sex Something, you know, just just throw it something that is real. For, for a man, of course. Um, it will come into play. If someone walks naked, you can't expect, for example, um, someone doesn't even have this kind of you know, arousal, for example. If it's not, then something wrong with that person. So, likewise, the touch, the, the physical connection, and so on, there is always this, even in, in a biological sense, there is the rule of that. There is a rule of that. So, what Islam does is we leave all of this to. Within a boundary of 
the way it can happen, for example, in marriage, it's fine, or if you're, when, when it's done, no sexual attraction and so on and so forth. For example, you can shake hands with an elderly woman who has lost um, any... No, actually, some story they said they've actually lost... Even that, you see? But there are things where you can... Um, say, for example, if, if you have someone in your house, a young in a child, in maturing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so on and so forth. There is a whole load of, you know, practical consideration and manifestation in terms of how much connection you can have physically and how much not. And, and I appreciate that you appreciate that. Okay, this is as a, you know, it's a sign of our understanding of each other's uh, particular way of life. Thank you for having this talk with me. Did I do that correctly? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever is comfortable for you. Whatever is comfortable with you. But um, what's important is, you know, we have that conversation. Yeah. And we would consider it as further, you know, what is indeed the truth behind this. Because ultimately, the discussion we're having was that because we want to worship God. Yeah. We want to connect with God so that we don't end up in hell. We believe in hell. For the worst of the worst. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Christian, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 from the moment. I actually have a meeting I gotta go to. Fine, fine. I didn't think this would take as long as uh, No worries. Thank okay, you, you take Welcome. care. Take care of you. Thanks. All right, thanks. All right, thanks. Yeah. So what was the discussion? Um, we were discussing with the brother... Assalamu <laughs> The brother here, this brother. Yeah. Talk.